I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. All right, this is going to be what I like to probably think of as an extended special, okay? Um, we are going to look at a PBS documentary that ran in 2004. I have wanted to do this documentary for quite some time since I became the Student Loan Chit Chat channel. And uh, now that I am a video reaction channel, I definitely want to do this documentary. This is a documentary that played on PBS called The Secret History of the Credit Card. Due to copyright reasons, for the record, I am playing this under YouTube's Fair Use Act. I'm also only going to play a portion of it. We're going to watch basically from about starting at about six minutes in and we're going to stop after uh, probably about 10 minutes before the end. This is being shown for commentary and education purposes. Now then, with that said, the reason I am so passionate about wanting to show this documentary, and it's something that um, I, I haven't done it sooner because I really, I know it's going to take time to provide commentary on this because I want to take a very, very deep dive into why I filed bankruptcy in my 20s, okay? Um this isn't so much about student loan, but this is going to be more about bankruptcy number one and the tricks and traps and things that I fell into uh, when it came to credit cards. Well, we do take personal responsibility. I take personal responsibility for filing bankruptcy in my mid twenties for approximately $25,000. And trust me, I would have avoided bankruptcy, but I was already working a about a job and a half, a job and three quarters, and just realized I couldn't work 70 hours a week. I, I just could not do it for the amount of time. And that was in my 20s. And that was after falling very sick and realizing I just couldn't do it. You know, we can be told, put your bootstraps on, gear up, yada, yada. But in addition to that, we also have to look at who's helping us sink ourselves. Okay. Um, young people. Okay. Young people still very impressionable. Many still experiencing the world for the very first time where it's like, you want to go get ice cream? You don't have to ask mom and dad. You want to go to the movie? As long as you can afford it, you don't have to ask mom and dad. You have the money to buy this thing off the shelf. You don't have to ask mom and dad. In other words, it's for young people's very first trip out into the real world. But unfortunately, who are we introduced to right after our teach? Uh, well, parents first, teachers second. Oh, the credit card industry. And for many of us, that starts on a college campus. And for me, that's certainly where it started. The goal of this video is to show young people what I went through, what I did not know, the traps that I fell into. In other words, I want to show you the mind game that credit card companies play with consumers, young and old alike, all right, young and old alike, but especially the young, people who have not yet had time in the real world to understand exactly how they're being tricked. So yes, you take responsibility and that you ran up a lot of credit card debt, but you have to also understand that behind that responsibility, somebody was helping you, was helping push you off the cliff. You just chose to jump because you didn't know any better. This will take as long as it takes. So um, if for some reason, as I film this, I actually feel like I need to take a break either for, you know, emotional reasons, because I do have to put myself back there to where I was at. And that's a very difficult place for me to go. So if I feel like I need to take a break, I'll pause the camera, take a break and resume. But I am absolutely determined to help people learn from my mistakes because that is actually the purpose of this channel. I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. I'd like to thank you for joining me. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started six minutes in. This is the secret history of the credit card. The first six minutes basically is the introduction and it talks about the legal uh, history of the credit cards. I do not wish to get into the legal history of it. Okay. But again, this whole documentary can be found in the description box where you can watch it uninterrupted and I will only be showing parts. We're going to go straight into basically where it starts talking about credit cards. For the first time in American history, there were no legal restrictions on the interest rates banks could charge on credit cards nationwide. I bet many of my viewers did not know, especially younger ones, that at one time uh, banks 
what were expected to control their interest, their interest rates. There were actually requirements. There wasn't, oh, you can charge 29, 30, you know, those loan sharking interest rates. Yeah. In the olden days, that wasn't allowed. Banks had to charge reasonable interest rates. You could look at the Marquette decision and say, all right, maybe it took the lid off, but what it did was it had a very egalitarian effect. Egalitarian means by um, not having limits on interest rates. Egalitarian, basically think of it as the word equal. It made, every, it, it made the playing field more equal, so to speak. Duncan McDonald is the former general counsel of Citibank's credit card division. He says the Marquette decision allowed bankers to charge higher interest rates to riskier customers. Does that sound familiar? And again, you can watch this video from the description uninterrupted. Higher interest rates to riskier com customers. And we can say that that sounds logical. Okay, you know, you're a, you're a riskier customer, so you should pay more. And to some extent, even, I will agree. However, is there a point where it is so clearly obvious that the person the bank is lending to is it so clearly obvious that a reasonable and common person would say we should not lend them we should not be lending them money tie this with student loan debt is there a point where we're telling an 18 year old hey we want you to go get a hundred thousand uh, dollar student loan degree in drama okay taking an impressionable 18 year old and having them sign off on that does there come a point where the adults in the room are the corporate people, the corporate people, the people, the politicians, the legal establishment? Is there some point where these adults in the room that are lending student loans and lending credit card debt to people that don't know any better? Is there some point where those adults in the room should be held legally responsible? I'm not really... I'm not going to use this platform to say right or wrong, okay, because I, I, for, for today, that, that is not the purpose. But what I want to do is give you food for thought, something to think about. These people, the corporate people that have written the laws that are shaping the credit card practice, these are supposedly the adults in the room that have more insight to it than you have. Is there a point? where there's got to be some culpability, some responsibility. The minute Marquette came along, you could jack the price up a little bit more to cover those people. And as a result, tens of millions of people who were paying 30 and 35% interest rates to small loan companies all of a sudden got the product at 19% at interest rate and an annual fee of $20. So in that sense, it was very egalitarian and very good. And very good for banking. As the deregulation of interest rates enabled more people to get credit cards, the industry began to expand. And of course, deregulation simply means interest rates no longer adjusted. You, you, it's just the teacher and me. I make sure my audience understands all terms because you know what? At one point, I didn't know it either. And became the most profitable sector of banking with $30 billion in profits last year. This was in 2000 three they're talking about because the video came out in 2004. Think about what their profit is today. We wanted to talk to the executives of the major credit card banks about their business, but we're directed instead to the American Bankers Association. All right, let me ask you a question. If you want, if I wanted to do business with you, okay, we're just going to use my little cake company, okay, simple cakes by design, we're just going to use my little baby, okay, cake company for this, all right? If somebody said, you know, Carrie, I would like to find out how you operate your business because, um, you know, you, you like to do business with us and we would just kind of like to know how you operate it. And I said to you, oh, you, basically, you can't talk to me. You have to go talk with my neighbor. Would you think something was wrong? If you look at your relationship with credit cards, kind of like, well, a, a relationship. Imagine that credit card were a person and you can't talk directly to that person, but you have to go to somebody else. Does that tell you that perhaps something is wrong, that something is fishy, that something is being hidden? 
We've asked for interviews with all the major credit card companies. Mm -hmm. And guess what all those major credit card companies said? Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. No. They won't talk to us. Why? That Let, let's stop for a minute. Now, I know some people do their walking uh, on this. So, so I, I always try to, you know, assume that just because from the comment section, not everybody's actually looking at the screen. So um, here, here we have, and, and I am not bringing up Okay, I'm going to take a really sensitive subject, but you're just going to have to bear with me here, okay? So, so um, we're, we're, we're just going to speak it like it is. We have a white male. White male looks like he's, he's probably in his 40s, you know, pushing 50, okay? Uh, sitting here, who's going to tell us in his suit and tie from the Bankers Association, okay? This is the person we were being sent to. To find out just what the heck is going on with credit card companies. Yet, I want you to realize, though, that they credit card companies will advertise their wares to anybody. Okay? Almost regardless of race. As a matter of fact, the lower socioeconomic you are, the more vulnerable you are. And unfortunately, here in the United States, that oftentimes does deal with you know, the black race. Don't want to turn this into a race conversation. Okay. But I do just want you to see, we, we, we got to put all the cards on the table and figure out who's telling us, who's telling us this information. So here we have your corporate white male executive. That's our job. Uh, they pay us dues to handle these kinds of sometimes difficult assignments. What, what, what the hell's so difficult about it? He, he basically what he's saying is, oh, well, well, I'm with the Bankers Association. It's the Bankers Association job to do the talking for the banks. Why can't the banks talk? What's so secret? Well, I'll tell you what's secret. They don't want you to know the dirty tricks that they do. You see, th 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 this guy's paid. He is paid to say the right words. He's been drilled, especially before they go in front of Congress or something. All right. Everybody's had practice before that. Why, why won't MBNA talk to us? Why won't Citibank? Why won't Capital One? Why won't Providian, there you go, pick one. Why won't they talk? Why, why can they not speak? If they are good enough to hand you a credit card at 30% interest, for God's sakes, I just did a video the other day on the after chat. Okay, the after chat is the little fun stuff that I like to do after I do the main video. Okay, I did a video the other day on the after chat of American Express. American Express wants me to pay $695 for an annual fee. But they won't come online. I mean, excuse me. They won't. They won't come on uh, video to tell me. These are things I did not know. So let's hear what this paid-for executive lobbyist from the Bankers Association has to say. Ed Yingling is the incoming president of the American Bankers Association and the industry's top lobbyist. Oh, now we all know what lobbyists are, people who are highly paid by an industry to uh, push their personal agenda, preferably into the halls of Congress. And I don't care what party you are. It's Democrat and Republican alike. How profitable is the credit card business? The credit card business is profitable. You would expect the credit card business to be somewhat more profitable than the rest of the industry or parts of the industry because it's riskier. Uh, it is an unsecured loan, and so you would expect the returns to be a little higher. Wasn't last year record profits for this industry, and they're expected again this year? Remember, this was filmed in 2004, so they're talking about 2003. He's talking about the record profit. Uh, yeah, but compared to what? It is not an unusually profitable business compared to other businesses. MB&A's profits last year, one and a half times that of McDonald's. Well, McDonald's didn't do too well last year, and MBNA is a big company. Citibank more. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. So he's kind of speaking out of both sides of his mouth. One minute he's saying credit cards aren't that profitable, and then the next minute he's saying, well, we did better than McDonald's. But yeah, we did better than McDonald's, but McDonald's didn't do so well. Why is it? If a credit card company is so confident about their business model and they feel that that this is the best for people, that they are really serving their customers, black, white, you name the race, okay? Black, white, Indian, Asian, I don't care. If these credit card companies feel like they are doing society this huge favor with the best laid out uh, credit card plans offers, why do they have to hire this dude to come talk? 
All right. Why do they have to do that? Because they know that secretly what they're doing, it's just a big game. And that's what I want you to learn from this video. It's a game. More profitable than Microsoft, Walmart, and the executives are highly paid. Right. You know, the guy looks awfully sullen for someone who's making, banking millions and millions of dollars a year. <laughs> I'd have a smile on my face. I'd be all cheery. Oh, yes. <laughs> These are really big businesses and they do make money. So one minute he tells you we don't make any money. The next minute he tells you we make money. Dude, pick, pick a side. Today, nearly 144 million Americans have credit cards and they are using their cards like never before. Oh my God, check out those cash registers from 2003. Holy cow. Oh, I love the sound that they make. Okay, back on track. <laughs> Charging $1.5 trillion last year alone. Credit cards have become an essential part of the American economy. I really can't say that I love my credit card, but I would hate to live without it. I use it a lot for work. It's easy, it's easy access. I can take clients out for dinner. I take advantage of the miles. We fly first class on vacations. Now, I will be honest. I have uh, a couple of American Express cards. I use one of them in particular because I get about $400 in um, cash back per year. I never pay interest on the card. And um, Dave Ramsey, you know, you'll hear Dave Ramsey say, nobody ever got rich using credit cards to get cash back. I wasn't planning on getting rich. I just wanted to get my $300 Neiman Marcus cake pan for my, I got it for my 44. 54th birthday, I think it was, and I got it for 20 bucks after after the cash back. I use it for treats and rewards. I do not use it because I think it's going to make me debt free or somehow or another make me wealthy. There's nothing wrong with using credit cards for cash back. I like to think of credit cards today like a gun, okay? you can. It's not the gun that kills people. It's the ding dong behind the gun. Who, whoever it is that's shooting, hopefully they're, you know, doing it responsibly. It's not credit cards, people, that will hurt you in and of itself. It's your lack of knowledge about credit cards or your inability for uh, self-control, like I had. It's nice to be able to spend what you don't have. All right, everybody hear that? I would play it again, but I don't want to mess up the video. It's nice to spend what you don't have. And guess what? That is, a, that, that, that is what they want you to believe. That is exactly what the credit card companies want you to believe. There was a thing in the 80s when I was growing up. It may have been 80s, 90s, and it was, there's this, there's that, there's this, there's that. And for everything else, there's MasterCard, or maybe it was Visa. Anybody in my age bracket will know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? That's what they want. They want you to believe that it's totally socially acceptable to buy things now that you don't have and you cannot afford. Does that remind you of a student loan by any chance? Can you imagine living without a credit card? Me personally, I could not imagine living without a credit card. I have to be honest, it is very wrapped up into my life. But as someone who is now debt free and I've had control of credit card spending for decades, um, I can honestly tell you, in spite of everything else that I've been through in life, after my bankruptcy with credit cards, I learned my lesson. But I must tell you, I actually had to read about it. And of course, the Internet didn't exist at that time when I was in my 20s when this happened. So I had to read books like Your Money or Your Life. I had to figure out what the hell, what the bejesus just went wrong that I got there. This is this documentary is what I read about in books as I literally started researching credit cards. And when I tell you literally, I actually sat down and read book after book and started going, holy cow. So this is the credit card industry. The one that I thought loved me because they sent me a gold card when I was a senior in college and the gold card was promoted. Again, anybody my age would know this. Okay, so I'm 56. The gold card was promoted. I mean, that was status. And I remember getting that $5,000 gold card. I went, they love me. The, the credit, and not, not in the sense of, you know, it's a person. Okay, it wasn't like that, but it was like, oh my God, I, I, I've just been given this coveted card that I wasn't even sure my parents had. That's how much of an emotional uh, response I felt after being given that gold card, I truly, and, and I'll never forget it. Okay. 
I truly, truly believe that that gold card elevated me. It elevated me socially. It elevated my self-esteem. You know, okay. The way I feel about myself, that gold card elevated me. In this society. It's hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. We sat down with a group of credit card customers to talk about how they use their cards. We're consumers. America loves to consume. It's in our blood. It is like an addiction. I mean, I have this new credit card in my pocket, and look at that great dress. I can do it. I really shouldn't do it all. I'll just pay it off later. And you do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want you to do. Better yet, the credit card companies would like you to pay it off later, preferably forget about it, then be charged a late fee, okay? then be charged an over limit fee. That's what they really want you to do. If I don't have that iPod, I'm not cool. Yeah. So I can charge and pay it off. Just the way I felt with my gold card, okay? I, I mean, if I could tell you how emotionally driven I was by that gold card, if I were to put it on a scale of one to 10, okay? 10 being the absolute highest, one being the lowest of emotional response, I put it at 11. I really, truly believed that that gold card elevated me mentally, psychologically, it elevated me. Yet I couldn't tell you how the damn card worked. <laughs> okay. I, I couldn't tell you how it's like you've been given a Porsche, so to speak, but you don't even have the keys to drive the sucker. You get behind the wheel and you crash it. Okay. Cause you weren't skilled at how to drive it. Which is why a lot of times people will, you know, parents will say, I think really responsible parents will say, you don't need a flashy car because you haven't learned to respect the little Toyota. We don't need to put you behind a BMW. Go earn that on your own. Smart parents, in my opinion, you put kids in a car that can't go too fast, isn't too flashy. Okay. Teach them the rules of the road. Get them some years behind driving. If they want fancy and flashy later, they can do that. <laughs> hopefully responsibly. And Christmas is just around the corner. There's always something. <laughs> They're just a gift. For the traveler, which I am, a very, very, very frequent traveler indeed is what I am, uh, they are indispensable. Actor and... I, I, I agree. They're indispensable when you travel. I absolutely agree that you really do need them. Author Ben Stein loves the convenience of using his credit cards. Credit cards are an incredible deal for me. I mean, I have lots and lots of different cards. I, I mean, my wallet is just stuffed with cards. It's just insane. It's just ridiculous. I look like, I, I look like I've got a third breast from my uh, carrying around my wallet with so many credit cards in it. Thank you very much. For those who can't see the video, I would say he's holding like 40 credit cards, and I'm not exaggerating. When he says it's, his wallet is stuffed, it's stuffed. I would say I probably own 10 credit cards today. But again, I've had very good control of credit card debt for decades, not just recently, decades. Thank you very much. Have a nice Thank afternoon. You. Thank you very much. Stein says he charges thousands of dollars a month in business expenses on his credit cards. Well, I use all their good services and they don't make any money from me. I mean, none to speak of. Away. Credit card companies don't make any money from me either and they haven't made money from me for decades either. Um, and the last 10 years is Especially, I, well, actually, I would say mm, they really haven't made money from me probably for close to the last uh, maybe pushing 20 years, but definitely the last 10 years, no go. They, they, I, I'm surprised I have as much as many credit cards as I have because um, it's just a game, as you'll see as we get further into this. They don't make any money from me either. Here's a kind of cute one. The credit card companies do make a percentage on each transaction. But Stein is not their ideal customer, because like 55 million Americans, he pays his bills off every month and doesn't pay any interest. And that's the way I operate, and I've operated like that for years and years and years. I don't pay any interest, and um, I'm sure the credit card companies would get rid of me if they could. The credit card companies hate people like me who pay off our bills every month. And I know that because I ran into a fellow I went to high school with on the street and he told me he worked for a credit card company, and I told him about how much I use credit cards now. I pay them off every month, and he said, oh, we, got, we hate you. We hate you guys. We call you deadbeats. Ah, deadbeats. Think about that, audience. Think about that. 
the person that you're doing business with, that you're helping give money to, because they do make a certain amount off of every transaction, just like, um, you know, Bill Stein was saying, but the credit card company calls you a deadbeat. If somebody could have taken me back to the age of 21, 22, because it took me a couple of years to run up that $5,000 card. It didn't take me long. It took me a couple of years. And then I tried to make the minimum payment before it all fell apart, became part of a $25,000 bankruptcy. Nowhere on that gold brochure, when I got my gold card, did they say, Miss Horn, if you don't run this up, if you don't pay over the limit fees, late fees, if you pay this card off every single month, we don't like you so much. We're going to call you a deadbeat. Why don't they put that in the brochure? You see, you're going broke for a company that's willing to call you names behind your back. Would you have a friend that did that? Would you be friends with somebody who called you names behind your back? I seriously doubt it. And I hope you would not. They call customers names behind their backs and you wonder why they don't want to go on camera to talk about their dirty deeds and they hire some other guy to go on camera and they pay him in the multi-millions of dollars to do so in his suit and tie to basically tell you the customer how stupid you are because they got one over on us don't be friends with someone who calls you a deadbeat but believe me the credit card company has all sorts of terms to call people that do the right thing and pay off their bills. Deadbeats in the upside down world of the credit card business are the people like Ben Stein who pay off their bills on time. The industry's best customers are the 90 million Americans who don't pay off their credit card debt. They're Those are your best customers. Called the revolvers. People in the industry tell us that, that revolvers, people who borrow money basically with their credit card, that's where the profits are. I don't think that's where all the profits are. Well, I, think, I think it is generally understood that those that use the revolving part of the credit card uh, are are kind of the sweet spot. Yes, they they that I I could be wrong. I imagine a whole lot of money is in the late fees and over the limit fees. The triggers on that. Today, the sweet spot, as Mr. Yingling calls it, continues to grow and the top interest rates charged are higher than ever before. Look at that, 35% for some people, 35%. That's their, that's their sweet spot. That's their sweet spot for, for you, 35% interest. According to Robert McKinley, who founded CardWeb, a research firm that tracks the industry. The top 10 issuers in, in the country are charging interest rates of 25 to 30 percent to some of their customers. And that was in 2004. And this is in a market where interest rates are at a 40-year low. We have consumers paying interest rates that would be considered loan sharks uh, in my day. And the more so socioeconomically poor you are, the higher your interest rate's going to be. And let's face it, oftentimes that's associated with race as well. At the same time, Americans with credit card balances are carrying a record amount of debt. How much credit card debt is the average American family carrying? About $8,000. This is Elizabeth Warren before she became a senator. I think she's a senator in Massachusetts, I believe. She, she's been in the Congress for years. For those who are carrying some debt. Elizabeth Warren is a Harvard Law professor. She has researched the growing credit card debt held by middle-class families and how it can lead to big trouble. And what families are discovering, even with mom and dad in the workplace, is they often can't make it to the end of the month. And so they often use credit cards to bridge the gap. They borrow to make ends meet. And then what happens is something goes wrong. Somebody loses a job, somebody gets sick, family breaks apart through death or divorce. If I were to have played you that clip from Senator Elizabeth Warren, because she's now a senator, at the time she was not. If I were to have played you that clip about credit cards and families that are, you know, 
struggling in hard times, trying to make ends meet. And I told you that clip was just interviewed yesterday. Would you know the difference between 2004 when this was filmed and 2023? Would you know the difference? No. Nah. Why? Because as I've said before, we could learn from stuff years ago. Why? Because when you really get down to it, the only thing that changes is the year. That's it. Look, look, look at what's happening with families right now. Look, look at the price of rent. Look at how people are struggling after the pandemic. Some people that, you know, not, I, I know not everybody struggled during the pandemic, but plenty of people did. And they had to run up credit cards just to survive because their job got cut or reduced or downsized. She doing okay? Like most Americans, Jim and Juanita Mueller managed to pay their credit card bills each month until they both lost their jobs. We didn't have any emergency funds set aside, so they... Dave Ramsey would have said, oh, you should have had a $1,000 emergency fund. But let us all remember, Dave Ramsey went bankrupt. Dave Ramsey went bankrupt. And I don't want to track off on this and talk about his bankruptcy, but let, let, let's just remember that, okay? kind of became our emergency fund to to fund our life while we were waiting for the employment to come along. I've been there, okay, using the credit card to fund, you know, emergencies. I think most of us at some point probably have. But what I've learned is if you don't have money coming in down the road that can cover that emergency on your credit card plus put you in a surplus ahead of that then you're only going to be falling backwards okay it's it's not like oh i have a four hundred dollar emergency but i got a bonus coming from work so i can throw the four hundred dollar emergency on the credit card i've got a work bonus guaranteed coming that'll pay for the emergency plus i have my regular check okay that's different it's still better however to have an actual emergency account so you borrow from the credit card and pay the, that month and then the job doesn't happen so now you got to borrow more and, and we just kept digging deeper and deeper and we started robbing peter to pay paul as the expression goes you know take a money from a credit card to pay other credit cards been there been there been there been there and most people who have filed on bankruptcy have played every credit card trick in the game most people who have filed bankruptcy involving credit cards, we've done it. We've done that shuffling routine. Which card has to be paid first? Which card, card can be held? Which card can I take a cash advance on? Because I got, you know, I, I have 40 extra bucks I can squeeze on that. I've even been to the point where you start looking at the cents. C-E-N-T-S. You start looking at the cents available on a credit card. Okay, I have $2.99 left. Think about that. When you start looking at the cents, when, the, when, when less than a dollar matters. I've made deposits into checking accounts for 25 cents to try to keep something from bouncing. When you start getting down to the cents, where the sense of matter, you have a very serious problem. You had a problem long before then, but you definitely have a problem when, when you can't even look at the dollars. And I literally ran to the bank because I was going to be 25 cents short. That's how tight I was. And when I had credit cards, it, it all became to, okay, I, I have $40 and 10 cents. So I could take out $40 and nine cents because I can't zero it out. It's, it's, it's exhausting. It is exhausting to rely on credit cards for your financial survival. And that just increases it. It's then that's where it really started to snowball. As the Mueller's fell behind, their credit card companies began to apply penalty interest rates and fees to their bills. And that is what they want. Young people, this is what they want. They want you to either forget about the bill and go, oh my gosh, I'm late. OK, and then you might call in and try to beg them to, you know, uh, reverse the late charges. Sometimes they would. Sometimes they would not. Most times they would not. But 
you have to understand this is what they want. This is where they become the Grinch and they start rubbing their little green fingers together and they cackle. And does the Grinch cackle? Okay, but they rub their little green fingers together. They go, "Ooh, this is this is what we want. We want a revolver who 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 pays late fees, who pays over the limit fees. Because guess what they can do with those fees? They don't just charge you those fees. They raise your interest rate. Yay! You are the customer that they want. You are what they're looking for." You forgot to pay the bill. You couldn't pay the bill. Even if you call in to try to extend the due date, yada, yada, they're not going to do it. That is, you are their ideal customer because you are still going to attempt to catch up the bill. Okay. You you are the customer that they want. You know, you you don't want to file bankruptcy. All right. You're not going to be on that far extreme and you're not going to be on the far extreme of somebody like me. I'm going to pay it off. You know, as I've done for years now, okay? I pay it off every single month. Done that for decades. Like I said, this was only in my 20s that I had this huge, massive hiccup with the credit cards. I learned other stuff in my 30s, okay? But that's what they want. And yet you're going to be the customer that still fights to keep paying off the bill. Even if it means more over limit fees. Even if it means more late charges. You are the customer that they want. Do you remember when the interest rates started to rise ah some of them d- didn't i just say that i just said that one late payment and forget your old interest yes one late payment so for those of you who love that zero percent apr okay you got to watch that like a hawk you have to set that up on auto pay you have to make sure that it meets the minimum payment because one late payment Not only can they raise your interest, they can cancel the 0%, go back to the beginning of the purchases that you had when that deal started. And guess what they can do? Ding, 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 ding. They can raise all that interest back in and put it, apply it towards the card. So you got $50 off of interest because you were on a 0% plan. Um, you have one late payment. You're now from 0% to 23%. Oh, and by the way, those purchases, when the 0% started six months ago, guess what? We get to charge interest on that because you effed up. All right. Deal that you had. So, uh... playing with credit cards. It's like going to a casino, okay? The favor is in the house. It always is. When she said the deal that you had, yeah, casinos have a deal too. Casinos have a deal where you come in, you play your money. If you win something, you rightfully get to take it home. If you lose, well, you know, have an extra piece of pie at the dessert bar. But who is it in favor of who is the person that's setting up the rules of the game did you have any say in how the rules of the game were played you go to las vegas and go you know what but the color on this table this is not my good color i you know green just isn't the color for me that's not my lucky color do you get to change the color i don't think so i don't think so who sets up the game i don't think this payout is fair i want this payout it's always in the house's favor when you play with credit card companies Think of it like a casino. It's always in their favor. They make you a deal in quotes. But is it really a deal when you get no say in it? Now, some people will say, well, yeah, it's a deal because you don't have to take it. Okay, fine. And I would even respect that if the CEOs uh, in charge of these banks would actually put their faces on camera and tell it to my face. But instead, they hire someone else to do it. Don't forget the fact that you had the credit card for a number of years and were paying on it regularly. We're never late. And as soon as you make what you miss one payment, it's like all deals are off. Oh, yes. How many of us have been through that? You, you've had a card. You've had it for years. OK. You go through one downspout in your life, one downturn, one wrong direction, no matter how momentary, it's like, oh, we, we never even knew you. It's like insurance companies that cancel people, you know, been with you for decades, been, you've been with them for decades. Okay, one, one error, one error, and you're out, potentially. Everything goes up. I mean, some of the credit cards we had were 9% or less. All of a sudden, they're 24, 25% because, oh, well, you're late. 
you've been late several months and now we're going to raise your interest rate and we're charging you the late fee. And now because the interest rate and the late fees have accumulated, now you're over your limit. So there's an over limit <laughs> fee. And that's the deal. That's the deal that the credit card companies make with you. You know, probably another reason that bankers don't want to come on, like they don't want to be seen on camera. They don't want people, there are crazy people out there. There's some crazy people out there. They don't want to put their face out there. There, there are people out there that, you know, I, I don't, I don't like, like to say they'd go postal. Okay. But, but th there are, there are some people out there. They don't, they don't want to be seen. The deal makers don't want to be seen. Is that a problem to you? It should be. The Mueller's credit card debt eventually grew to nearly $80,000 on 10 cards. Jeez. They found that they could no longer keep up with their payments and had to file for bankruptcy. Well, it's not the matter. It, it's not how much we file bankruptcy for because everybody's situation is different. I believe Ramsey filed bankruptcy, if I'm correct, on uh, possibly millions because he was in real estate. Okay, they filed bankruptcy for 80,000. I filed bankruptcy for 25,000. Bankruptcy is bankruptcy is bankruptcy. They were one of a record 7 million families to file in the last five years. It wasn't that we didn't want to pay off our, our credit cards. It's we got to the point where it was impossible. And the credit card company sure as hell helped to make sure that it's impossible. Instead of working with you and saying, okay, Mueller family or... Okay, Horn, it's apparent that, you know, you obviously are unable to pay it at this time. What can we do? They don't want to do that because honestly, remember, to a bank, this is just a write-off. It's not, they would rather spend their time, banks would rather spend their time fishing for new, for fishing for new clients, fishing for new bait, so to speak, than, and just use you as a write-off. It was just... I mean, short of uh, a rich relative, which neither one of us have, dying and leaving us uh, $100,000, nothing was going to happen because the credit card companies weren't, they weren't willing to work with us unless they got all their money as fast as possible. The main things that trigger a bankruptcy filing are a job loss, a medical problem, or a family breakup. Without those things, most American families can deal with their credit card debt. But high credit card debt puts them at much greater risk so that if they stumble, if mm -hmm. they get hit by one of the other blows, they get their feet tangled up in those high interest rates and they just get sunk. Zero percent for life on transfer balances and a three, up to three percent cashback bonus. Ironically, the Mueller's are still getting offers for more credit cards. When I filed bankruptcy, and I, I had heard and trust me, that was a very, very emotional thing to do. Filing bankruptcy, the bank, the first bankruptcy that I filed for, the credit card, I, I will tell you, that was so difficult to take. I remember just almost feeling unworthy of living. Like I, I had just effed up so badly. And yet I couldn't figure out what I had done. In other words, I didn't understand Well, I have always accepted responsibility for it. And I accepted responsibility then too. I was left really trying to figure out what happened, what went wrong. And this is when I decided to start reading about credit card companies. And the more I read, and I mean, I read books. I'm not talking, you know, like I said, the internet didn't exist. So I'm not talking little news clips. Uh, uh. I sat down and I read one book. I think it was 500 pages. And it was literally the entire history of the credit card company. I read that sucker from forward to backwards because I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong to get myself in such a financial mess. And it's easy for people who understand debt, who perhaps were raised with understanding credit cards, because maybe they had, they had parents that showed that taught them. I did have parents that taught me how to use credit cards, not blaming my parents. I just did have it, as I'm sure probably millions of us did have parents that taught us how to use credit cards. But what I part of what I was trying to figure out is how the hell did I get into this situation? It's like I woke up one day. I, I, I grew up, went to college. I as a campus student, 
was shown this opportunity to get a gold card. Okay, it was status. It was sold as status, not just on the campus, which was the University of Oregon, Oregon. It, it was sold as status on TV. I saw it in the commercials. I saw it on billboards. I People my age will know exactly what I'm talking about. The gold card was a big deal. I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was doing what social, uh, it wasn't social media back time, but, but what I saw socially going on. So I was given this credit card and I'm like, I'm doing this right. I make my first purchase. It was some bed sheets. I think it was probably around 100, 150, somewhere around there. The bill came, it was a few hundred, but I only had to pay 25 bucks. Okay, well, I, I'm doing this right. What went wrong? Well, what went wrong is I didn't realize I was starting a spending addiction. I didn't realize that my background, my personal background was playing a part. And I certainly had no knowledge that all this stuff I was being bombarded with by credit card companies was helping to cement in my brain that was still maturing, still growing, still impressionable. Okay. And they are even, even, you know, late college students, you know, the brain still grows at least for a while from what I understand. Okay. I couldn't figure out where I had messed up. But then once I started reading about credit card companies and I started going, Oh my God. Okay. All right. Now I see, I fell for this. I fell for that. I fell into this trap. I fell into that trap. I started to piece this stuff together. I could start figuring out where I was responsible, but yet who was also helping feed my drug addiction. And in somebody of my case who had a shopping addiction, that was the beginning of the shopping addiction. All right. That was the beginning of the shopping addiction. Filing bankruptcy did nothing to stop the offers from coming in because people say, Oh, you know, you filed bankruptcy. You won't be able to get anything for seven years. Baloney. I've been bankrupt twice. G give it 24 months. Give it 24 months. Yeah, you know, you won't get anything immediately. Give it 24 months, three years at best. You'll, you'll, you'll get, you'll get back on your feet. And, and, and the offers, the offers will come in before you've probably even had your discharge papers from the court. And I am not kidding. And the reason these offers come in is because now you cannot file bankruptcy again for 10 more years. And the credit card companies know this. So they have a roster. They have a whole roster of everybody who's filed bankruptcy. They have the roster of the people who have, you know, I call it the pre and their post bankruptcy roster. Okay. One category, all the people have not filed bankruptcy yet. And then we have another category of all the people who have filed bankruptcy. Oh, they licked their chops because you filed for bankruptcy. You can't file for 10 more years. You, and the fact that you filed for bankruptcy says you have no money. So guess what you need? You need a credit card to now get you through. But because you have a bankruptcy, we're going to give you a credit card. That's even more expensive than the credit card you went bankrupt on. Do you see the game? Do you see the game? I never saw it. I didn't see it until it was too late. You're still getting solicitations in the mail. Yeah, we got yeah. one yesterday from a credit card company that told me I would never have credit with them again. Oh, you'll have a credit with them again, but it's going to be from a different division. It's going to be from their riskiest division. And believe me, the interest you will pay will reflect it. One of the last times I talked with them and told them what our situation was, they said, well, we're canceling your card and you are in essence, blackballed with us for life. You'll never have a credit card from us ever again. Yesterday received a solicitation from them, 0% for life with up to a $50,000 line of credit. And that's exactly what they did with me too. Because now you, in some ways, in, in some ways, um, you're more attractive to them now. Because like I said, you can't file bankrupt. They know you can't now. Diapers, milk, and laundry detergent, $25. Oh, yeah, and that stuff he just said. Spend more time with your family, priceless. Encouraging Americans to take... To every, for everything else, there's MasterCard. I have not seen this documentary all the way through. Um, like I said, it's, it's been a few years since I've seen it, but when it came across my feed, I was like, I, I need to see it, so I only skimmed it, but oh my goodness. Yep, for everything else, there's MasterCard. Yeah. 
take on credit card debt is critical to the profitability of the industry. Oh, look at this picture. Okay, for those that are walking or those who can't see the screen, we, we got paradise. We got a happy uh, couple in the pool. They, they, they just look like they're, they're bliss. We got the blue sky. We got the white clouds. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That, that, that's beautiful. And then we got the 1-800 number. We got the mascara card. See, this, 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 is, this is the crap that I fell for. Now, maybe not in the sense of, oh, my goodness, credit card's going to be paradise. No, no, that's not how I fell for it. I fell for it as credit cards make you feel good. Credit cards elevate you. Credit cards free you. They free you. This is bliss. But notice, just like with student loan debt, you know, in, in the student loan pamphlets, do they show you the students who are crying on TikTok because they can't pay their bill? Okay, just like with credit card companies, do they show you the Mueller's who filed bankrupt? Do they show you people like me who filed bankrupt? Do they tell you that the head of the banking association is the only person allowed to speak on camera because all the other little thieves in the night don't want to show up? Now, nah, but they want you to believe that this, we are looking here at a picture of paradise. He's holding her. Her head is tilted back. She's laughing in the pool. Oh, how wonderful. That's just, it's not a pool. Excuse me. It is a paradise. It looks like a river, a lake, something like that. Oh, wonderful. Hawaii. Oh, it's Hawaii. Snaps for Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Call now to request the City Advantage World MasterCard and you can earn free award travel plus get 10,000 bonus miles. Making it easier and more attractive to spend has been the job of Madison Avenue marketers. New tool belt and chrome tool set, $126. Getting some use out of it, priceless. There are some things money... He's opening a beer. He can't buy. For Father's Day, there's MasterCard. But the success of the industry has also relied on financial innovators like this man, Andrew Carr, whose peculiar genius, industry insiders say, has helped shape the way the credit card business works. Carr. You know, we sit and we say that the, uh, you know, people who invented the, what is it? Was the Hiroshima, the uh, nuclear bomb? Okay. We, we. We can look and say, you know, the, the creators of nuclear war, we can point to those people. We actually can look up who created it. But in a way, isn't the credit card industry the same thing? It's just more hidden. Isn't the credit card industry a nuclear bomb? Because we have to remember for the way that credit card companies run today, Somebody had to think it up. Somebody had to sit there with their little grinchy fingers and go, okay, now um, we know that we have people who are really poor, okay? And we want to get them to go to companies like Amscot to turn their paychecks over to us. We're going to take a certain fee, all right? And we're going to set up in the poor minority communities and we're going to make sure that, you know, we're, we're all over town there because that's what we want. Somebody had to think that dirty deed up. A consultant who rarely consents to interviews only agreed to talk with us if we did not identify his clients or where he is currently living. Does this give you an idea as to who you're doing business with? I mean, I have a freaking cake business that like earned nothing this year and you can find me. <laughs> I mean, like Jesus, okay? And I don't and I don't do deals like this. Doesn't it seem that the more risky the deal, the more people it can potentially affect, the more people it has the ability to hurt. Doesn't it seem like there should be a face out there? This is like making a bomb in secret. That's really what it is. It's a bomb. It's a bomb in secret. Yeah, I know we can look up. Okay, you're the head of this bank. You're head of that bank. Okay, but most of us won't ever take the time to look that up. Okay, I'm just kind of one of the weird ones. I'll take the time to read an entire book about it. All right, but isn't this kind of like a bomb? They are doing this. You know, when I got that gold card and any other card that I've ever received in my 20s, I had no idea this crap was going on. Okay, now, of course, I filed bankruptcy, you know, in, in the 90s. But I, I had no idea that this is what they thought of me as a customer. 
Give me an idea of, from the time you got involved, late 70s, with credit cards, the ideas, the innovations that you've come up with. Well, don't you mean the torture method system? I convinced the client that instead of having 5% of the balance as a minimum payment, we should reduce that to 2%, which is a very dramatic change, less than half. And he doesn't want you to know where he lives, and he doesn't want you to know his clients are. Hmm, should sound suspicious. Before Andrew Carr got involved in the industry, most bankers required that customers pay 5% of their credit card balance every month. Carr realized that if customers were able to pay less, they would borrow more. You were able to explain that it was people making low payments who were the most profitable. Having a lower minimum payment allows you to offer higher credit lines, which first of all makes your card product more attractive because people judge, even if they don't intend to use the whole line, they would rather have a higher line. The high balance accounts will be much more profitable than the low balance accounts. Because they're paying interest? Because they're paying interest on a higher balance. Today, CAR's 2% minimum is a common feature on millions of credit card bills. And every month, some 35 million Americans pay only the minimum payment. By the way, while you're... Those are the revolving people that they love the most. And we have to remember, people can sit and say, well, look, nobody's being forced to take out a credit card. Yes, I, I get it. I get it. All right. But if you are going to take it out, you need to know the dirty game that's being played behind your back so you don't fall into those traps. That's what you need to understand. That is what I didn't understand. You need to understand that those credit card com that those credit card commercials on the beaches of Waikiki or wherever they were at, okay? They call you names behind your back. I mean, I sometimes wonder how some of these bankers sleep at night. Like they, they probably sleep on a stack of credit cards born of low-income people who can't make the payments and are making them rich. We're running up balances on your credit cards. We currently have balances on your credit cards. Do you have cash in the bank? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can wipe my debt out. So why don't you do it? I feel this is a nest egg. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You might need that money for something else. And if you need that money for something else, but you don't have a way to pay it off, okay? I mean, they say they have cash in the bank that they, that they could wipe it out with. See, the credit card, want, the credit card companies want you to think that you must have them, that you cannot do anything without them. There are conveniences I love with them. I love the travel convenience, okay? I really do like that a lot. Um, in fact, my credit card was, uh, I'm sure we've all gone through this, I had unauthorized charge. I'm not going to say from what company or what my bank is, but I had unauthorized charge from a foreign, con from a foreign country last week. OK, uh, my credit card company immediately reversed it. It was very clear I had not traveled <laughs> overseas probably the last 50 years of my life. OK, um, since I was 16, that was the last time I was overseas. So there are protection conveniences I love with credit cards, but I'm fully aware of the mind game. But there are people who literally believe that they need the credit card. And that's exactly what the credit card companies want you to believe. You need them. So even though you're paying double digit interest and you could get rid of the balance right. or most of it you're going to still make those payments and keep the cash in your bank account right what she fails to understand is if she's paying the if she's paying interest then her so-called savings is being dwindled okay uh, yeah I'm, i have a savings account and i have a credit card account but your savings account actually means nothing and you're dwindling it because you're putting the interest, you're paying interest on your credit card. That was a game, that was a mental game I had to learn uh, to get out of. I, I had a gal pal, and I think I talked about it earlier when this first became a video reaction channel. And um, one of my best friends, she had a savings account and she had a student loan that was like in the mid-teens. She had enough money in her savings account, more than enough, in fact, to wipe out her student loan. And th this is all recent. This is like in the last six months, okay? She wouldn't do it. And I would ask her, why aren't you wiping out your savings account? Of course, I said it very nicely, like, 
girlfriend, why aren't you wiping out your savings account? Okay. <laughs> All right. And she, she would tell me she didn't like the idea of giving up that saving security. But what I was eventually able to convince her and she did eventually wipe it out, but took her about four months to do it is you're more insecure with credit card bills than you are with a savings account. Having a savings account where you are invisibly paying interest to your credit card, well, you're just dwindling your savings account. It's a mind game. It's just, it's a mind game. Andrew Carr's research showed that making the minimum payment eased consumers' anxiety about carrying large amounts of credit card debt. They believed they were being financially prudent. If you lose your job or you, you know, something bad happens, you have to have money and you don't want to live off of a credit card. So you need to have that money, you know, saved somewhere in case something happens. It's kind of funny. She says you don't want to live off a credit card, but what are they basically doing? Living off a credit card because they're charging it up and only paying the minimum payment. Like, well, we don't want to live off credit cards, but we're going to live off credit cards until we get an emergency and then we're not going to live off our credit cards anymore. In fact, the industry was reaping huge profits from Andrew Carr's intuition about people's behavior. But then in the late 90s, Carr says he had a new insight. Customers were being flooded with competitive offers for low interest cards. People were offering 12.9% interest for the first six months, 10.9% uh, on balance transfers, and I convinced a client to go straight to 0% as an introductory rate. It gave them competitive advantage. It led to, of course, the others also going to 0%. Carr knew that even though the 0% offer could easily change, people would still be attracted to the bait. Oh, did you hear the word? Did you hear the word? Bait. Bait. B-A-I-T. Would you have a friend if they said, oh, you're bait? Would, would you have a friend like that? Do you see what's happening? You are a sucker. You are a bait. You are a deadbeat. You're a deadbeat if you pay it off. Oh, you see? You got to learn the mind of the credit card company, which in an indirect way, now I'm actually saying it's direct, will help you with student loan debt. How will it help you? Because you understand the game. I've always said student loan debt is just a fancy name for credit card debt. That's all it is, especially if you're going with private loans. When you're getting something in the mail several times a week that offers you 0% for six months, they look at the headlines of the solicitation in the mail, they spend 30 seconds on it, and okay, I'm going to be better off at the beginning. They're going to give me something. They're going to give me a 0% rate. Uh, people believe what they want to believe. Zero. And did you hear him say that several times in the mail? Because they know that the first few times you're going to be a little angel. You're like, no, no, I, I'm not going to go for this 0%. Yeah, I mean, it's great and stuff, but we are a responsible family or a responsible household of one or many, okay? We are not going to do it. They send it to you several times. I, like I said, I, matter of fact, hell, let's, let me, heck, let me take a look at this. Okay, so, so I just, on the other day with the after chat, I opened up my, American Express offer, you know, for a $695 annual fee, American Express Platinum. I would say they have now sent me that about eight times. I get that offer about once a week. Well, literally, as I had just got done doing my after chat on that for this channel, look what came in the mail for me yesterday. Now, if you can see it, hold it up to the camera. Oh, that's got my address on there. Well, we're just going to pretend we don't see that. Although if you really want to look it up, you can. You know, nothing's private anymore, okay? So, you know, but there we go. Another American Express offer. Another American Express offer. They do this because they're hoping at some point you will cave in. And just go, okay, well, I guess, you know, they keep nagging me, so I might as well do it. 0% APR. What does this mean? I mean, <laughs> you're saying that's meaningless. Most cases, if you were to sign up for this card, the bank will honor that rate through that period of time. But there's a lot of fine print that goes with uh, what could happen. For example, if you were to miss one payment, uh, this rate will go away immediately. According to McKinley. And they know that lots of people are gonna miss that payment. You, you, you see the game? Are you seeing the game here? 
They know that they know that enough people are going to miss that payment. They, they know the 0% ain't going to stick around. It's not going to stick around. Yeah, there'll be a few people like me. Oh, trust me. I, I'm on it. Okay. Of course, I don't really use it that much because I, I don't really have much to stick on a card anymore. Okay. But it's like when I do use it, the few times I have used it, you know, I made, I made sure it was in my favor, so to speak. I think I used it when I uh, got this condo, you know, what's, what it is like buying property. Okay. But I made sure that I followed every rule and I paid it well before it was ever due. The key to understanding how credit cards are marketed lies in the great digital revolution, the amassing of data on American consumers. Well, there's a gold mine of information residing out there in these databases by the consumer reporting agencies. The there's a gold mine of bait. There's a gold mine of bait that we are fishing with. Credit bureaus. Uh, they're collecting information about what kind of accounts you have open, the balances, whether or not you make those payments on time. And that's a huge reservoir of information there. And they are praying that you don't make those payments on time because, damn, the people who make their payments on time pay it off. You are the deadbeats. I've never been so proud to be a deadbeat in my life. That they can tap into and be able to get a sense as to whether or not a consumer is a revolver, someone who doesn't pay the balance off in full each is that consumer easily manipulatable? They're also looking at that. It just doesn't look good for them to say that, but are you manipulatable? Month, So they can kind of sift those out. And, and, and today it's really become almost surgical. The ability to- Oh, now, and, and look at companies like uh, Facebook and all of that stuff. They know your shopping habits. Have you ever like gone online? And I swear to God, okay, you, you, you look for two seconds at something and what do you see next? On your social media or popping up, the exact item you looked at. And sometimes I go, th th this, they had me dissected before I got to the next technical device. You know, I'm on my phone, I look up one thing, then log on to my computer, and there it is, just waiting for me. <laughs> to surgically target consumers and track their financial behavior has become a booming business dominated by three credit reporting agencies Ex which gather in Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Information. All that data is then crunched by a little-known company called Fair Isaac, which calculates a number called a FICO score for almost every American with a credit history. We're not a credit... And of course, we know Dave Ramsey says your FICO score isn't necessary. If you had $2 million, $200 million like Dave Ramsey had, and you could insure yourself and everything, Probably not necessary, but for most of us, yeah, FICO scores matter. A reporting agency like an Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian that's gathering information daily on consumers and building up consumer records. Tom Quinn is a spokesman for Fair Isaac. We simply work with the credit reporting agencies and they deploy their data onto our mathematical formula to create that score. Don't, don't you love the vocabulary used? We deploy. <laughs> When you come to understand that when you get these offers in the mail, guys, you're, you're, you're just potentially their next victim. That, that, that's what this is really all about. That, that's what I want you to see. You are a statistic. Sa same thing with colleges and universities. When people apply to go to colleges and universities that they cannot afford, that they have no parent helping them to afford. And these students go to these colleges and universities that, you know, like I said, maybe they have no parental help or the parental help is so limited. Okay. And even parents who can get sucked into the college and university game that don't have the income to be able to support the debt. Okay. They, they want you to go in thinking that this is personal when in reality, you're just a number, you're, you're, you're a database. The median FICO score is 720 out of a possible 850. The riskiest customers have scores below 600. The score is an indication of how likely you are to pay your bills. Lenders use that score almost like a thermometer to determine if they're going to grant credit or not. So and the lower you are on that score, the more that credit is going to cost you. I will tell you, I probably have about, oh geez, two, four. I probably own about eight credit cards, eight credit cards. On every single one of those credit cards at some point in the year, multiple times, I get offered 0% interest. It's like they, they, they just don't seem to communicate really well with me and understanding that I'm not going to pay you crap. 
I am not paying you interest at all on anything. But their hope is that if they offer me 0%, I'll stick something on there, forget about it, and I can get into the, you know, the shark feeding tank with everyone else. No. Now, I do put a little item on there just to keep the card active and to keep the FICO score above 800. That's the only reason I do it. And I do uh, one, what I bet I do about two cards a month. And I'll put a little, I think I put some Listerine on there not too long ago. I mean, we're talking something small, something that just goes ka-ching, she used the card. Because as you know, when you close accounts or if you have accounts that have not been used for a really long time, um, it, it can hurt your FICO score. Because for the real world, <coughs> excuse me, for most of us, we have to deal with the FICO score. That, that's just all there is to it. We got to deal with it. So the algorithm is an indication of that consumer's future risk in terms of credit behavior. And they don't want the, the credit card companies don't want people like me that are going to pay it off. OK, they want the people that are going to struggle just enough that they're going to pay some late fees some over the limit fees. They're going to be revolvers. Don't fall into that shark tank. Algorithm meaning a mathematical formula. Mathem yes, mathematical formula. And how many people have this number? We estimate that approximately 75% of the U.S. population that is eligible for credit, i.e. those who are 18 years or older, have a FICO score at any given time. You know your credit score? Mm -hmm. You're There's... not aware that you have a credit score? I'm aware that I have one. I don't know what it is. Right. Yeah. I, don't... I didn't know what a FICO score was when I got a credit card. I, I'd know, I'd no, not even sure I even had ever heard of it. Not even sure I'd ever heard of it. I had no idea what a FICO score was. I had no idea that if I only paid the minimum on my credit card, it was designed for me not to be able to pay it off for like 30 years. Just like people who get student loans and they're all jumping for relief because they have because they have 0% payment on their student loan. You're, I'm seeing this all over. Uh, TikTok, especially people are going, oh, I'm so glad I am so broke that my payment is 0%. I'm relieved of my student loan debt. No, you are not relieved of your student loan debt. First off, it means you don't make any money. Okay. Uh, but even more so, it means that your interest on the interest can grow even under the save program, the save program. People should not be looking at the student loan save program. That's, I think it's a saving on a viable education. Okay. People should not be looking at that and thinking it's just this completely interest free thing, but we're not going to get into that. Okay. Not, not for this, uh, chit chat. All right. But people need to understand this. Okay. A lot of the terms I was not familiar with. I had never heard of a FICO score. Couldn't have told you anything about it when I was issued a gold card, but damn, did I not feel important because I had a gold card. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know what it is either. So if I said to you the words FICO score, do you know what a FICO score is? No. I know the terms. I'm not clear on what they are. I've never gotten my credit score. And these are full grown adults. These are people easily, if you hear some noise in the background, that's my Alexa. Uh, these are full grown adults. Okay, people usually look like they're in their, you know, 30s, early 30s, maybe late 20s, early 30s. They don't know. So now you give a credit card to an 18-year-old. Give a student loan contract to an 18-year-old. An individual's FICO score often determines how much interest he will pay on a credit card. The terms and conditions of the card are laid out in the fine print of this contract. When I get a Check that out. I'd rather read the Webster's Dictionary than the fine print of a credit card contract. A credit card, there's a, a contract that goes along with it. What kind of contract is this? Because I never read it. Have you ever read it when it came to you? Uh, I'd have to admit, most cases I may have just glanced at it. You know, it's filled with so many legal terms and so many pages and such small print. And it can be intimidating, I think. It says that I'm guaranteed the terms of a loan for as long as I have the card. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, things that, the one unique thing about the credit card business is that the issuer can change the terms and conditions at will. Did you hear that? The issuer, that means the bank that you have that credit card with, can change the terms on you at will. Any reason? Oh, well, um, we said we would give you 699 percent for 24 months, but we've decided, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to skip the 24 months. We're going to jack you up to 18% Merry Christmas. 
they can change the terms on you at will. Imagine, imagine walking into a, into a restaurant. You're going in to eat a wonderful meal. Maybe you've budgeted a hundred dollars for it. I personally, I think I've only eaten a hundred dollar meal a couple times in my entire life. And that was paid for. Um, it was a business thing that I was on. But um, imagine walking into a restaurant, you, you, you see the menu, it's priced one way. You consume that menu thinking that that's the price. Then the final bill comes and they doubled everything on you. And you're like, well, what, what just happened? Well, what happened was the restaurant is allowed at any time before, during and after your meal consumption to change the bill on you. Would you eat at that restaurant? Would you eat at that restaurant? I sure as heck wouldn't. I'd be like, no, if I sit down at the table and it says my clams are $14.99 for all you can eat, and then I consume that $14.99 all you can eat, and then you give me the bill and you decide to make the clams 50 bucks. Well, why'd you make it 50 bucks? Well, we changed our mind. Or better yet, you ate one too many clams. <laughs> Without asking my permission? Absolutely. They can change it all. It only takes 15 days notice to make those changes. And during this time, dur during 2003, you know, if you look at your credit card bill now on the back, um, it shows you, okay, for most people now, okay, of the major credit cards, they actually show you now, if you only make the minimum payment, you'll pay this much in interest, you'll pay it off by this year. If you make the maximum payment, you'll pay this much in interest, you'll pay it off by this year. That only came really uh, within, I think, the last decade, that it's not been around that long. It's not, I, I say last decade. When I had credit card bills in my 20s, that stuff didn't even exist. Don't even think of that. That wasn't even a thought, that it would be laid out for me to at least tell me if I only make the minimum payment, it's going to take me 30 years to pay off my $500 in sheets, so to speak. I mean, you could be offered a 5 or 6% interest rate today and perhaps get it. Two months later, that could be 30%. There's nothing to prevent the issuer from changing those uh, conditions. And people can say, again, people can say, well, nobody's forcing you to do business with them. I agree. Nobody's forcing. The problem, however, is this is not laid out in simple easy to understand terms, especially in 2004 when this documentary was made. I don't even think it's simple and easy to understand now, but it is a little bit easier in the sense of, you know, you can at least look at the back of your card and say, okay, if I make this payment or this payment or this payment, oftentimes I think credit cards will give you three choices. I don't, I always pay my credit card bill in full and I pay multiple times throughout the month. So honestly, I haven't seen that in ages because I, I, I don't carry a credit card balance. But from what I have seen, you know, a few years back and from what I know, that's what they now do. And like I said, people can say, well, nobody's forcing you to do it. That's fine. But you must explain it to me. You must tell me. You have to remember, people don't know what they don't know. Therefore, they cannot ask the questions that would help them make a better financial decision that might save them from a bankruptcy or save them from struggling. Okay. You don't know what you don't know. You can't ask questions on things you don't even know exist. I couldn't ask questions on them calling me a deadbeat because I pay my bill off every month because I didn't even know they called me a deadbeat. I couldn't ask questions on what it's on, on you know, hey, could you please tell me uh, exactly why do you call us bait? Because I didn't know you called me bait. So this is where I believe credit card companies have to take some responsibility. Even Professor Elizabeth Warren, an expert on contract law, says she has a hard time deciphering her contract. I've read my credit card agreement and I can't figure out the terms. I teach contract law and the underlying premise of contract law is the two parties to the contract understand what the terms are. Have you ever read? Why is it we don't allow people under the age of 18 to sign contracts? Is it strictly just because they're under the age of 18? No, it's because they they don't have enough knowledge. I think part of it we assume is they don't have enough knowledge. They don't have the vocabulary. They don't have the, the mental aptitude, yada, yada, to be able to really make an informed decision. But does that change much with college students? Does it change much when people are taking out debt? 
student loan debt that they don't understand these contracts to because it's not spelled out easily. Again, you can't ask questions on information you didn't even know existed. And you cannot rely on them being honest with you. It's like if you went in and you said, okay, I would like you to explain everything to me that I may not have thought of. Well, do you think they're going to tell you everything? Hell, they won't even show their faces on TV. Don't expect them to help you. And again, this was before the age of the internet. I, I did. I wasn't able to go online and just type in, how do credit cards screw us over? The contract that's sent to you with your credit card? Yes, but I'm a lawyer. <laughs> He's saying he understands the contract that they send to him with a credit card, of course, because he's a lawyer. Do you understand it? I, I do understand it. I think it'd be very hard for uh, uh, a lot of people to understand. And I, th I think we can pretty much say everyone. I think it's a constant battle to try to figure out how you make disclosures and those types of things. Oh, it's, it's, it's not a battle, sir. It's not a battle. Write it in simple language. Write it in very simple language. Whole classes and seminars to help people understand. Don't hide behind the camera, okay? Get 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 your people out there in front. If MBNA is so confident that their credit cards are fair and egalitarian, why not stand in the front and explain it to us? It's in plain English so that somebody will uh, uh, read them. Ed Yingling says the fact that the contracts are difficult to understand is not the industry's fault. Our disclosures are very explicitly set forth in law and in regulation. Much more. And how many people have degrees in law and regulation? More so than in most consumer contracts, uh, ours are, are heavily regulated. They heavily written in code to manipulate consumers in the hopes that consumers don't understand it and get to learn the lesson by trial and error. Say. The contract contains information, even the typeface, that's mandated by law. The laws... But the laws, that's the point now. The laws are inadequate. There's not enough there. These guys have figured out the best way to compete is to put a smiley face in your commercials, a low introductory rate, and hire a team of MBAs to lay traps in the fine print. There you go, folks. That's how it's done. That's, that, uh, that's how you become shark bait. That's how I became shark bait. One of those traps, according to Warren and other critics, is something called universal default. If you do miss a mortgage payment, you do miss a car payment, any other, it can trigger what is called a universal default. They actually have the right to change it if you miss a payment with another creditor. So you screw up with one creditor, it's reported to all the creditors and all the other creditors go, oh, shame on you. We're going to change you. We're, we're going to change your uh, rates because you messed up with another creditor. So mess up with creditor A, then creditor B and C find out, even though you did nothing wrong with creditor B and C, it's going to be a domino effect and creditor A, B and C are going to raise you because you messed up with creditor A. Or in some cases, even if there's a change in your credit worthiness. In fact, you don't have to miss a payment. You don't have to go over your credit limit to be in default. You could, have, for example, or maybe your balances are too high. This, you, you've seen all one of these, right, before? Mm -hmm. I want to read you something from a, a contract. Your APRs also may vary if you are in default under this agreement or any other agreement that you have with us or any other related companies for any of the following reasons. You fail to make a payment to another creditor when due. Do you understand what this means? That's the universal default he's talking about. You fail to make a payment to another creditor, to creditor A, we as creditor B can raise your rates because you messed up with creditor A. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You do. Do you know that it means that if you fail to make a payment and are late on anything else that you're paying on, your house, your car, anything mm -hmm. else, they will find out and they can change your interest rate. Did you know that? I had no idea. No. I had no idea. This is the first. I had no idea. First I've ever heard that. Well, why is it legal? Mm -hmm. Well, because 
the, it's disclosed in the contract. It doesn't seem fair. You've, you've done no harm to the company themselves. You're late with someone else. You, you don't know what questions to ask because you don't even know these actions exist. When I look back at how I went broke, yes, I take responsibility for my actions, but I also understand that I was very ill prepared and I had never been taught how credit cards work. There was no explanation ever given to me. And I'm not going to put fault, to, you know, on parents or whomever. Okay. It just, it is what it is. It is what it is. I did not know. I did not understand. And when I ran up my card, the first five, the $5,000 gold card, probably like every other person who's ever had a runaway credit card, I swore when I got it that I was responsible. I would not run it up. But that sweet nectar of, oh, I can have it now. I, I, I don't have to wait. I could have this right now. All I have to do is just give them a card. In the olden days, they had this wipey that went back and forth with that really loud gray machine. Okay. That's, that part is on me that I didn't understand. But I think a part of that could also lay with the credit card companies, even if it's so much as 1%. Okay. I didn't know what I didn't understand. And it was only after I went bankrupt and had my self-esteem taken down so low, I actually decided, you know what? Let's read about credit cards. Now somebody could say, well, why didn't you read about it before? Again, I did not know what I did not know. I didn't understand and I can't understand what I don't know. I haven't affected your standing with that company, no, it doesn't seem fair that they would suddenly say, oh, well, now we can raise your rate. They're taking advantage of someone who is in that position. Remember when you play in Las Vegas, the house, 99.9% .9 of the time wins. When you deal with the credit card companies, I think they win pretty much 100% of the time. That's what Andrew Guile of Wilmington, Delaware, says happened to him. Yes. Um... I had gotten a letter from MBNA several months ago that my rate was going to be increased. MBNA raised his 8.9% interest rate to 19.9%, and his minimum monthly payments nearly doubled. They told me... And that can be financially... That's my Alexa, just giving me my reminders. That can, if in case you can hear it in the background, that doubling of the minimum interest to somebody on a very tight budget that can be financially devastating. I had so many credit cards, like a, you know, that it, it literally, Robin from Peter to pay Paul, double one of those credit cards, I was in trouble. The first time that my rate had been raised because they found an occasion back in 1998 when I'd gone 60 days past due on a competitor's credit card. And I asked them, what in the world does that have to do with MBNA, especially being six years ago? I said, that has nothing to do with my account here. I mean, that absolutely took my breath away. When Guile protested, he says he was given another reason for the change. He had become riskier, he was told, because his account balances with other creditors were too high. I was a great customer at MBNA always paid my balances on time, paid more than the minimum balance, you know, many times paying it down completely. But I was, I was never late, and I used the card in a wise and responsible manner. Frontline wanted to ask MBNA about Guile's problem, but we were told they never comment on an individual's account. But they'll be happy to sell you their credit card. You know, th they, they sure do little talking for wanting so much from the masses. But just two months after our interview, Guile says he got a call from the office of the president of MBNA saying they would move his interest rate back to 8.9%. But what did it take to do that? What did it take to do that? Oh, we have to make a news story out of it. Think about that. The real question here is whether or not you can change the price, not for new items you buy after your credit score has changed, but for old credit that you've already taken out. 
my mortgage company agreed to an interest rate, and if I lost my job, my mortgage company does not get to double my mortgage. Credit card companies can say, remember how you bought the big screen TV at 9.8% interest? We've decided we want 29.9% interest, and there's not a darn thing you can do about it right now. And as my credit was tanking, as I was getting closer and closer to, ba to bankruptcy, my interest kept getting higher and higher. But again, I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand it. The contract allows a credit card company to change the interest rate on money you borrow mm -hmm. from them after you've borrowed it. Uh, some do. Yeah, it depends on the oh, contract. Oh, no, no, no. Not some do. They all do. They can all change that restaurant menu pricing whenever they want. Some do. If um, they find out through this information system that you've been late on your payment for your automobile, mm -hmm. they, they can notify you and that, that you're going to change the interest rate on the money they've already lent you. Uh, and I think there is a misunderstanding about what the credit card agreement is. My agreement with you is you've come to me, you have a certain credit score. And based on that credit score, I'm going to charge you 12%. If in the future, it turns out that your credit score has deteriorated and you now are more risky to me, mm -hmm. I'm gonna charge you the interest rate I would charge to somebody that has that credit score. But they're gonna backdate that to prior purchases, to prior purchases. They're not gonna say, okay, all these prior purchases you bought are at the rate you, you signed off on, okay? I could even understand that, okay. Fine, I messed up. My interest rate's going to be raised on new and future purchases. But nope, they can go back. They can go back and say, nah, we're going to raise that restaurant price on you. And your new purchases now, I mean, excuse me, and your old purchases are now at the higher, at the higher uh, cost. This is why with, because I have about eight credit cards. I have about eight credit cards now. This is why with my credit cards, just to keep them rotating, I only ha have, uh, two cards active at any one time. Okay. I have my main card that is used for like everything. And then I have the little sidekick card because I, I rotate it just to keep them active so they don't drop off. You know, I think I literally, and I think I put Listerine on one, some contact solution on another. And then literally as, as soon, like the next day, as soon as it hits on the card, I just pay it off. It just makes the card go ka and be active. But juggling a bunch of cards, no, those days have been gone for decades. Is it fair to change the price of the deal after the fact? The product is not a promise to somebody that we will lend you that amount of mon money forever at that interest rate. It is a very short-term revolving line of credit. It's a Do they spell it out like that, though, when you sign off? Do they spell it out like that for 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old college students when they're on campus? Does your student loan spell it out like that when you take on the debt and say to you, basically, we can't guarantee that you're going to find a job in this field that you are looking for, that you're going to be paying these tens of thousands for? Okay. Do they spell it out like that on Parent PLUS loans to explain to parents, especially low-income parents, that just want to see their child, their first-generation child go to college? No, it's not spelled out like that. Honest. Plain and simple, it's dishonest. They, they may say it's good business for their financial bottom line, but it is a very poor way to treat a customer. But we have to stop thinking of credit card companies as customers. Your bait. My American Express thing here, that's bait. Th th this is fish food. I'm holding up my American Express envelope for those who can't see the screen, okay? It's fish food. I get an offer from American Express at other credit card company stores. I get offers from stores almost every single day in the mail. In 1996, another important Supreme Court decision opened the door to bigger profits for the credit card industry. Of course. And a raft of new complaints from their customers. That decision, Smiley versus Citibank, much like the Marquette decision before it, lifted state restrictions this time on the fees that credit card banks could charge. We were 
working this thing here for a good cause, free market pricing. Duncan McDonald was one of the lawyers who worked on the Smiley case. The late fees that were common across the industry up until Smiley were in the $5 and the $10 range. And Reasonable. the economic thinking was that there had to be flexibility to allow up to $15. But when Smiley came along and took the lid off it, it went from 5 to 10 to 15 to 29 $40. And it's gone up to 39 I would. You wonder why your credit card late fees are 40 bucks. Sometimes, oftentimes, the credit card late fees could be more than the item you purchased. Guess that it's probably going to go up to $50 a year and a half from now. I certainly didn't imagine that someday we might have ended up creating a Frankenstein. Frankenstein? What do you mean, Frankenstein? I look at that and I say to myself, is $50 a fair fee plus a 25% interest rate and all these other fees that are thrown on? But the credit card companies will simply say, well, you don't have to use the card. That's fine. I'll buy that. But before I buy that, spell it out to me clearly. Simple, you know, write write a portion. The terms that I would want to know. That because because guys, they, these these uh people they, these credit card company execs, they're they're not dumb. Okay, they know the basic information the average consumer needs to know. S stuff that this documentary is talking about. These are the basic things average consumers want to know. Put it on a really simple layout for us so that we understand it. Write it at a middle school level. So I can sit down at 21 years old and go, oh my goodness, you can raise the interest on me if I miss a payment? I didn't know that. Explain it to me in simple terms. For folks who are probably not that risky, is that fair? I look at it and I say to myself, there's the Frankenstein. We've created something that, that, that has, to be, uh, has to be dealt with. Since Smiley, credit card companies have doubled the amount of revenue they generate from fees. Late fees, over-the-limit fees, return check fees, and the like. Fee income uh, has gone up much, much faster than interest income in the business. So the yes, they make more money on fees than they do on your standard you know, calculated monthly interest. Think about it, especially they can get double fees. I had tons of double fees before I went bankrupt. I was doing everything, I did everything I could not to file bankruptcy. The fees are meant as a penalty to make sure that you pay on time, or are they a profit stream? Well, they really have become a profit stream. It's not. Did you hear what he said? It's a profit stream. It's not about fair to you, it's a profit stream. You know, I'm a teacher. And if I were to apply the way credit card companies work, if I were to apply that to education, it might work something like this. A student has papers, they're all on time. They're all on time. And then student submits one late paper and I go, you know what? You just submitted this paper late, okay? Guess what? All your other papers that you submitted before, before this paper. I'm going to make all those papers late too, and then that's going to become your final grade DF. See, sometimes what we have to do is we have to take the way the credit card companies are operating, because there are people who defend the credit card companies and go, this is fair, this is fine. Well, then if that's fair and fine, should I grade my students like that? I mean, if we take the same concept and we apply it to different industries that people work in, Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, eighth grader. Um, I know you submitted the first four assignments on time, but this fifth assignment is late. And so therefore, the first four assignments are all going to be penalized. Would we say that that's fair? Would we tell a student, well, you know what? I'm um, just, you, you know, you, you didn't, didn't have to take this class. Yes, your responsibility. You should have turned it in on time. Take Take what's going on here in the credit card industry. Take the mindset, the manipulation, the games, the name calling that they do to their customers. Apply it to other industries and see if that would work. Not just the fees that they charge, even though they're three and four times higher than they were uh, less than 10 years ago. That's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the penalty that's inflicted on consumers with these uh, situations where they make a late payment. It's the penalty interest rate that really does the damage. Your interest rate could double overnight. But just so I understand, the, the, the interest rates are not regulated. They can change the interest rate relationship that you have with them with 15 days notice. Because remember at the beginning, at the beginning, 
Okay. Interest used to be regulated. It's no longer regulated, meaning there is no government oversight that says what interest should be set at. So that's a major source of profit for them. And the fees are now no longer regulated. That's exactly right. It's, uh, you know, it's wide open. Uh, we're beginning to see banks do all this tweaking uh, where they're changing uh, the interest rates and uh, uh, raising fees, adding new fees. Uh. And this is in 2003. Look at we, excuse me, 2004. Look at where we are in 2023. Look at the state of the economy. Look at how many people are relying on credit cards. Look at how many people that were relying on credit cards have had the credit cards pulled from them where banks are going up. You know what? We're, we're taking away this card and we're taking away this card without notice. Uh, all kinds of the way they calculate interest, setting the due dates on a Sunday and a holiday on the hopes that uh, maybe you'll trip up and get a payment in late. It's become a very anti-consumer marketplace. Well, when the when, when your friend, quote unquote, refers to you as bait, that's probably a friend you should not trust. Do not make the mistake that I made and view your credit card company as something that is personal to you in the sense of, oh, let me take a look at this American Express card. Your offer as has arrived. If I remember, I'll, I'll do this um, at the very end because I haven't even read this latest offer. Oh, my God. Even the industry's top lobbyist is concerned. I think it would be short-sighted for a credit card company to have fees that, that uh, would make somebody angry because we already have fees that make people angry. Thirty nine ninety nine dollar fee for don't you love the thirty nine ninety nine? Call it what it is. It's 40 bucks. Because they're likely to lose that customer. And I think it's going to cost them more to replace that customer uh, than they're likely to get out of the fee. You have bankers who have uh, skyrocketed rates from 14 percent to 25 percent and forty dollar uh, uh, late fees and uh, bad check fees and so on that fall on the shoulders of the less well off. Yes, this who are typically uh, uh, the minority population is given. Uh, you know, they oftentimes take a, take a fee bath. Not just minorities, of course. Okay, but socioeconomic. You know, I, I look at the offers that I get. I get so many offers for zero percent. I have full control of my budget. I can take advantage of it. Take someone who's not financially in my position. Take me back to, you know, age 21, 22. Naive, didn't understand it. Or take me even at this age, you know, maybe a few, just enough rings of bad luck, their, their situation isn't good. Something bad has happened. So we need regulation. Well, we have regulation. We have regulation already. The control of the currency regulates all the national banks. Uh, and they have very vast powers. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, is an obscure Washington agency, part of the Treasury Department, and it regulates the national banks, banks like Chase, Citibank, and MBNA that issue most of the credit cards in this country. Julie Williams is the acting Comptroller of the Currency. This is going to be one of the last few interviews, and then we are going to wrap this up. We have three goals to make sure that the banks don't fail, to ensure the integrity of how the banks operate their, their corporate governance, and to make sure that they deal fairly and honestly with their customers. At the extreme, we have the ability to take enforcement actions, and we have done that. We have taken enforcement actions. Can you give us an example of how you have brought a large institution to task? Uh, well, I think the, the, probably the most conspicuous in, uh, example of that would be uh, the action that we took uh, in connection with Providian. For people who may not be familiar with Providian, Providian is probably one of the lowest down dirty banks that ever, ever existed. Okay. Um, the bank Providian was literally, literally, uh, its success was on trying to figure out how to get poor people to buy their services and charge fees on them. Basically to take the poor demographic and go, hey, how can we manipulate them? That's not the story they tell in San Francisco, 
where in the late 1990s, the credit card company Providian Financial was experiencing double-digit growth. Providian specialized in yes. the riskiest customers with the lowest credit scores. They were targeting people with questionable credit or marginal credit, uh, people that couldn't get bank cards elsewhere. Pat Wallace is the head of the Better Business Bureau in the San Francisco area. First thing that got our attention, of course, were the numbers, and the numbers of complaints. Providian was involved in all kinds of questionable uh, offers and policies and procedures and operations. And if I'm correct, years later, I watched a documentary. I believe I am, I believe I'm correct on this. It was a former CEO of Providian who actually apologized about how down and dirty this bank is. Okay. But, and the reason I remember it is it struck me as odd that he only apologized after he made his millions and millions and millions of dollars. Then he apologized. But I do believe, I am 90% sure, okay, that was the, uh, the, the uh, Providian CEO. And, I, and I'm just sleuthy enough. I'll go see if I can find it. But he actually apologized afterwards. I don't know if it was the CEO, but was one of the lead execs of Providian who basically said, yeah, I guess he was having a hard time sleeping at night trying to figure out how to, you know, screw over the little people. Complaints about Providian from around the country mm -hmm. came here to Wallace's office. Providian, for example, was accepting payments from consumers on their accounts, depositing the checks, but not crediting the account for sometimes up to several weeks. What was the net result of that? Invariably, the consumer got a late charge. They were holding payments so that they could charge late fees and they could charge overdraft fees and in a sense- Over limit fees, 50% of their income were fees, not interest on the money loan. They were push yeah. pushing the envelope. And they got by with it for a period of time and they made a lot of money. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency is the main federal agency that takes complaints. Did they come to your assistance? No, they just simply weren't interested. You know, the response was, well, you know, we'll take it from here, we'll watch it from here. You know, it's not a problem uh, at this time for us. Okay, people, we are going to end it here. This is the spot that I wanted to end it at. Um, let me scoot this to the side. I got just some things here on my screen here. Hold on just a second. Like I said, um, I, I knew this would be long. OK, this is a this is a documentary I've wanted to pour over in detail. And if people think, oh, my gosh, an hour, 45 minutes is too long. I'll tell you what's too long. Too long is taking on a credit card that you don't understand the terms. You don't understand the terminology. You run that credit card up. That bill becomes uncontrollable. It takes down your self-esteem perhaps takes down members of your family. It can lead to divorce. It leads to bankruptcy. It leads to kids following the footsteps. And they too can be in just as much financial trouble. That's too long. An hour and 45 minute video to save one person. So they go, now I get it. Now you see how they rope you in. But even more importantly, now you see what your credit card company really thinks about you. All right, I'm Carrie. This is Student Loan Chit Chat. I want to thank you for joining me today. I will do this card here, uh, this American Express thing. I'll do it as an after chat for another video this week. I'm pretty exhausted. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you will consider subscribing and you have an awesome Sunday night and a safe week. Bye.